Welcome to the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-based executives, founders, and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. My name is Paul Edwards. I'm joined today again by my co-host and faithful partner in crime, Jason Todd. Jason, how are you this week? I'm great. And I'm looking forward to this conversation because it's about communication. And prior to the broadcast, I don't want to, I want to steal everything that Steve's going to talk about, but prior to the broadcast, he did bring up this very popular quote that to be clear is to be kind. Hmm. And I'm looking forward to what he has to say about that. Steve, welcome to the Emissary Authors Podcast. Paul and Jason, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to talk with you guys. A pleasure. And, and, uh, we, we didn't, uh, give full credence to Steve's full name. Steve Woodruff is joining us today and, uh, and his book is called the point as in get to the point, <laughs> which we're going to talk about today. But, uh, Steve, grateful to have you along with us. And, um, prior to the show, we were digging into how deeply this message that you're putting out there, uh, really uh, can help, uh, authors to think a lot clear, a lot more clearly about the messages that they're thinking about sending at the right time, which is before you send them mm -hmm. or what I've noticed that some authors do, which is just put it up there and don't really worry about whether or not you're going to be blown. Let's, uh, let's open with that. What would you tell an author who's thinking about writing a book? So here's the deal, whether it's an email, a presentation, a white paper, or a book, or everything in between. The same principles of how the human brain likes information apply. And so if you're an author, you better have a point. You can't just be throwing a bunch of things out there, 18 or 19 scattered things thrown up against the wall that aren't coherent. You've got to have a lead thought point of view, something that is going to be groundbreaking or life-changing or highly practical. And for many people, not just authors, but even leaders and, and speakers, you might sit there for a long time and after a while say, I'm not sure what the point is here. You know, and that's how to lose an audience. If you don't have a point and get right to the point, you lose people. And nobody is going to sell a, a great book if it doesn't have an extremely clearly articulated point and purpose that people get right away. Yeah. I, I love that you bring that up because we were just working through some uh, naming ideas for some books. And one of the concepts or one of the topics came up of the subtitle. And there was no subtitle on that book. And the, the title of the book wasn't very clear on what it what was going to be the benefit for the individual. And the, the thing I drew out was the first question the person's going to want to know is why do I care? Right. You look at, you look at a book. Why do I care? Why do I care? And, and there should be something out there that speaks to the benefit for that individual and whatever their pain point is, whatever they're wanting to do. And that's what, that's why I noticed on your book, the subtitle, how to win with clarity field communications, which is additive to the title, which is the point. I struggle. You know exactly for, what you're going to get. Yeah, I struggled for months with the title subtitle thing. I I kept wanting to say too much in the title, and I finally realized no, the title just has to be striking. It's not going to say a lot, but it's got to be striking. It's the subtitle that gives the what's in it for me. Hmm. And in my first book, Clarity Wins. I did the same thing. So clarity wins, doesn't say a lot, but you know it's going to be about clarity and it's something to do with winning. And then the subtitle is get heard and get referred. And mm -hmm. the point of that book is how to package your message so that you can earn referrals because we all know referrals are the most important way to get business. Yes. But a lot of people have no idea, no strategy for referrals. We have marketing strategies, selling strategies, content strategies. What about a referral strategy? So the title-subtitle combination is worth an enormous amount of time because that is going to be the first impression that's either mm -hmm. going to turn them on, turn them off. Yep. Right. So many people make snap decisions. And I think some people think about this 
the idea that, you know, people make these instantaneous decisions over whether they're going to continue any further in a conversation or they're going to pick up a book and they get down on that idea. Like, ah, oh, well, we shouldn't make that. Well, we do. It is the way it is. And if you can work with that, like you talk about, you can, you can win, you can move to that next stage. And if you, if you just don't want to work with that, then you're going to get left behind. And I love the idea of, for our authors out there, other aspiring authors, that title, that, that, that initial look should be striking once the, once the, uh, individual, the potential reader then makes the decision to read the subtitle, they've that conscious decision to go further actually is, uh, an indicator of them actually reading the book. Right. So make the title, uh, explain it further with the subtitle and then a lot, a lot of times people open to the back of the book as well. Yeah, the title of the point is a little ambiguous until you understand that I, I explained four primary rules of clear communication, and three of them have the word point in it. You've got to have a point. You've got to get to the point. You've got to get the point across, and then you want to get people on the same page. And those are the four basic rules that I explain in the formula that can be applied to books, presentations, emails, everything. Mm. And the, But the first one we've alluded to earlier, first you have to have a point. You've got to actually know where you're going. And if you cannot articulate the purpose and the importance in one sentence, you do not have a clear point. Yeah. And authors should have an absolute killer first sentence and first paragraph that will leave me in no doubt why this is vital and why I want to dig into it. Well, this is a big deal too. I mean, you, before the broadcast, you were just explaining that you were presenting with, you know, uh, two, two hundreds of people. I think you said 450 people who are hungry for this type of information because the difference between people who sell well, uh, or people who connect well, or people who have positive relationships does boil down to whether they can connect to their communication or not. This is this is sort of a the integral to the human experience, not just business. And I, th what kind of lessons do you unpack for folks who can use this more universally across their their lives? That's one of the things that fascinated me as I developed this book. So the first book I put out in 2018, and it was really focused more on branding and networking and the referral stuff. I knew that above and beyond and behind that was a whole lot more about clear communications that, you know, internal collaboration and emails, present, all of that. And I had done some workshops on them. I'd done some writing on them, but I didn't have all of it put into a formula. And I had this crazy idea that maybe there was one universal formula for any of 8 billion human beings to apply to any form of communication in any role personal or professional. And that's what I pursued. And uh, somewhere in the middle of the pandemic, after wrestling with this for I don't know how long, I came up. Four rules, eight tools. There it is. Anybody can use it. And it really is universal. These principles, often people will say when I explain them to them, they'll talk about their personal life, their marriage, their you know other things. The human mind is the human mind. It has certain rules, it has an operating system, and if we go with the operating system, as you mentioned earlier, the first impression, the initial moment of securing attention is the moment of truth. And the human brain has this one question it's asking about everything. What's in it for me? And I make a very big deal of that in the book. You've got to lead with the what's in it for me got to lead with the relevance because you may have something that's a billion dollars of importance, but if it's buried in the 14th paragraph under a bunch of jargon, nobody's going to get there and nobody's going to read it. Yeah. You've got to bring forward what matters to the listener. I'm thinking of two <laughs> recent experiences, neither of which were in written communication. They were actually in verbal communication, but I think I saw the same principle apply. And so about a week and a half ago, I was invited to a local conference and, um, there were several speakers, two of them were, uh, very good. Two of them actually just, I, I, 
I, I zoned out. Yeah. And the first one was actually like, if, if, if he had been the one who was, you know, sort of like the, the opening warm up act, bad idea. Yep. Not because of like what he said was like, I mean, earth shattering. The, the story that he shared was, holy cow, that's huge. But he took so long to get there mm -hmm. and spent so long combing through every single little detail of it. And I'm sitting there thinking like, no matter how, no matter how much empathy I feel for this person, it's boring me to tears. Yeah. Listening and to that's it. And that's a complete lost opportunity. You have one opportunity to secure that audience when you're speaking. Yeah. And you cannot waste those opening moments and leave people bewildered, bored, or confused. If you do that, you know what your competition is? It's right here. Yeah. <laughs> everybody has it and it's very interesting and there's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And every speaker is competing with a world of noise and a bunch of streams of information. And if we're not interesting and engaging and relevant right up front, we don't win. It took me back to, um, Jason, you've, I've heard you say this sometimes, you know, when we're talking to authors, we're saying, you say, if you were to give a, uh, you know, a 30 or 40 minute keynote to introduce yourself, what would you say? Because yesterday, uh, my bride and I went and learned to play pickleball for the first time. Now in, in fairness, this instructor was all of an 18 year old boy, right? Mm -hmm. 18 year old young man and to be polite, uh, and, and he, he was encouraging and he was helpful, but I nearly fell out of the pre-practice briefing because he decided to go through every single letter of the rules of pickleball. And luckily I'm old enough that I know what the object of the game is, but he never said what the object of the game is. Right. So I'm not even excited about hearing all these rules. I'm just like, can we just start playing and you can tell me the rules when I mess them up as we go along. <laughs> right. Uh, he was a, he's a wonderful young man. I'm not, uh, not, not attacking him. Just noticing his presentation could use some, hmm. some work. Well, he fell into the cardinal sin of bad communication and the cardinal sin is TMI, too much information. The human brain is overloaded mm -hmm. already. I don't need to hear the 67 rules. I just yep. want to know the basic stuff to get moving. And so I tell people, I use this analogy. You're there to deliver the needle, not the haystack. If you yeah. dump the haystack on people and make them find the needle, that's not kind. Actually, that's just adding to their work. Yeah. You're not making their life easier. You're making it harder. Yeah. So as communication designers, we've got to extract out the most important thing and say, here it is. We can't just commit random acts of communication, blabbing out stuff, and hope somebody's going to find something somewhere. And yet, yeah, that's how a lot of people communicate. Yeah. I remember back 20 something odd years ago, I was a department supervisor at a large retail company. And one of the things we talked about was selling warranties. Warranties are a big deal. And at the time they told us in some research backs this up that roughly 30% of people will buy a warranty if you simply ask. You don't need to explain it. You just, would you like an extended warranty? Yes. Despite a manual of detail, the last thing you need to do is open the manual of detail and then say, hey, based on all of the facts, would you like a warranty? Because they don't care. And, it, and it's striking in my mind how complicated as you're talking about this random acts of communication, it's, it does strike me how often we do commit random acts of communication rather than just saying the one little thing that we need to say to that individual to move them to the next step. Yeah. Right. All of the and, rest of it doesn't matter. And that's the thing. When I talk about having a point, I talk about the A to B shift. The A to B shift is right now, this individual or this group, they're thinking feeling and acting a certain way. As a result of my communication, my book, my talk, my webinar, my whatever, how do I want them to now 
think, feel, and act different. When you can articulate that shift, that's the point. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to define the purpose, the intention, and where you're going. And once you can do that, then you're far more ready to get to the point so that people can know right away where we're going. It's the worst thing to sit in, a, in an auditorium with somebody talking, and you know they're smart. But after 10 minutes, you have no idea where we're going. Yeah. That's not good. And, you know, once again, that's where I'm going in that case. I'm not going to keep tuning in. I don't, I don't need more work to figure yeah. you out. Yeah. So, <laughs> Steve, you're, we were talking, another thing we were talking about was how this begins to steer for, uh, particularly if you're running a company of a certain size. But, you know, even if you've got a relatively small one, but you do have people you lead, uh, and you're a leader, one of the most frustrating things about being in leadership is what I call replicating your thought patterns and your approach in other people because they don't have that. And you mentioned that you've been focusing on this a little bit, uh, with some of the groups that you're beginning, that you're uh, speaking to now. And I wanted to examine, peel back the onion layers a little bit on that and say, what, what do you, like, what do you notice if a, a large group of people, a couple hundred people all working in the same organization begin to get the point? Mm -hmm. And then when you watch them communicate and interact with each other, they have a point, they get to the point, they, what were the other two again? The, uh, get the point across. Get the point and across. And with the get ultimate the goal, page. let's get everybody on the same page. And what you're talking about, getting the point across, there's a very interesting mental model that we've got to understand. People assume that whatever's in their heads is in somebody else's head the same way. Yeah. It's not. We all have different definitions, different experiences, different ideas, and we can use the same words and not communicate at all because Correct. I didn't get my across. So that third rule, getting the point across, means that as a communicator, my job is to simplify, define, explain, and illustrate. Don't just throw the words out. What I mean by that is, or let me give you an analogy of that, or yeah. here's an example of how that works, or let me tell you a story. That's great communication. We should never, ever assume that people think the way we think, that they yeah. believe what we believe. So the onus is on us to not only get to the point, but make sure that we turn the light on bright. What is that thing? and use enough vivid imagery that someone goes, ah, okay, I get it. Yeah. So here's what happens when you go into an organization and now you have 20, 30, 50, 500, 6,000 people and you multiply all those different pieces of experience. There are so many opportunities to not be clear. And so what's needed is a framework and a set of tools, which is what the point book is all about, to where people can say, oh, you, you, didn't, you didn't speak to my reticular activating system, the RAS, which is the master gatekeeper of the brain. Um, one of the most striking statistics is that the human brain is processing 11 million bits of information per second from all five senses. Mm -hmm. Right now, every second, your brain is actually dealing with 11 million bits. And when you focus on one thing or one person, that's a 60-bit information flow. And so there's this marvelous function in the brain called the reticular activating system that throws everything into the background except the most important thing to focus on right now. Mm -hmm. The reticular activating system is, list is tuned into one radio station. What's in it for me? W-I-I-F-M. So if you start to explain across an organization, look, this is how the brain works. This is the operating system. You've got to have your what's in it for me. You have to get right to the point. 
You have to use stories and symbols and tell the stakes and, and you know, use little snippets to illustrate. If you can get a common language, then you can start to have it reinforce and people will all become better communicators together, which will lead to incredible efficiencies because so much time is lost in companies with misunderstandings, miscommunications, and mistakes that are mm. all based on words not getting there. Mm. Yeah, I think I saw in your one of your presentations uh, the George Bernard Shaw quote. Uh, help, help me out with that. It's <laughs> one of the greatest the, problems of communication is the the is the illusion that it has taken place. <laughs> so yes. we we just figure. Look, I I sent the email. Communication has happened. Yes. I stood up there and talk. I, we had the meeting. Communication has happened. Well, you know what? If you had meeting and you left it all on a verbal level and nobody summarized it in writing, nobody created the same page to make sure we could be on the same page, you didn't communicate. You yeah. just hope you communicate. And so it's simple things like that that we can never assume, never assume that communication has happened. We are up against 11 million bits of competition all the time. We are up against seven to eight hours of screen time. That's our competitor all the time. We should assume that people probably will not be tuned in and fully understand unless I do a really good job designing those words. Yes. One of the topics that you bring up, which I think is so important and often overlooked, is the idea of definition and how much our experience in our own lives has brought us to assume some definition because many, you know, even for, even for our own selves, how many of us actually look at the definition of the words that we use or the experiences that we have, what they mean to us, which then, you know, I'm communicating with you. I'm telling you about this, you know, when I was growing up, I had this experience, I had that experience and you, I just assume, you know, that you must've had a very similar experience growing up to me, you know? Yep. And, and if without that definition, we can be using even the same words and, and we are totally not saying the same thing. Yeah. Correct. There's a, a principle called the curse of knowledge. And the curse of knowledge is that, uh, we are so familiar with what's in our head. We just assume you've got it. So if I throw out acronyms, technical terms, I just shortcuts, whatever, just assuming that you know it. And if you don't know it, you're confused or you're filling in the blanks with the wrong meanings or, or we end up misaligned or you end up offended because you can't explain yourself at all. So one of the little tricks I, I encourage people to use is whenever you're explaining something and you think there's any chance that somebody in the room doesn't get it, you just say, and what I mean by that is, and then re-explain it, define it, illustrate it so that you remove the embarrassment from them feeling like, you know, I'm not going to raise my hand and say, what the heck do you mean by a QRC? What's a QRC? I don't know what that is. But if I throw out QRC and then I say, well, what I mean by that is, so, oh, okay. We're aligned. We got, I got it. Yeah. And so we just have to, again, it's real basic. Don't assume. Assume that things can be misunderstood, misheard, and forgotten. And yeah. therefore, be much better at simplifying it. Which I think to some people feels remedial. And, and here's why I say that, uh, this idea of curse of the curse of knowledge, very smart people sometimes are terrible communicators because they come at it with a, uh, kind of like the, Hey, I don't have to be remedial to, you know, we all know our stuff here, don't we? Yeah. Uh, and. There are cases across history where that has really got people into trouble, uh, including, you know, doctors and lawyers and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and I think that it's a skill and I don't know, maybe you, you know, you know, better than me, it's skill that, that not only be needs to be developed in a person to slow down the communication to, and take the opportunity to explain further, but it's a mindset first that I'm not dumb mm -hmm. because I sit there and re-explain it. And I don't think that you're dumb 
right. because I'm taking the time to explain it. And I, what, what have you seen with, with that mindset and why people do or don't take the time to yeah. be good communicators? Uh, we're often just in, in a little bit too big of a hurry. And people, you know, doctors, engineers, and tech geeks are especially bad at, you know, just throwing stuff out there and, and curse of knowledge problems and not explaining what's going on, not putting it simple. And what we have to understand is it's not an insult to anybody's intelligence to simplify. It's an act of kindness. So if you're really smart, you've acquired a bunch of knowledge that a lot of people don't have yet. They may be very smart too in their own domain. Yeah. And so I should never just assume that you've got this entire library of information that maybe I spent 20 years accumulating. If I can say it one way and then say it in another way, then I'm, all I'm doing is being nice. It's not demeaning and it's not a waste of time. It's a good use of time. You were made smart so that you could learn to simplify it for the rest of us. You know, um, I'm going to bring a, a little bit of experience to this, Steve, from an environment that is a, an unusual one, uh, where rules like this, even if they were known and understood, were overruled in the interests of... Um, in the interest of time or in the interest of not looking like a fool. And that was in the military. And, um, <clears throat> we would often be asked by commanding officers, does everybody understand what I mean? And we all understood you say, yes, sir. Even if you don't know what he means, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> because if you raise your hand, right. And, and so, uh, you know, like not, not, a, not in any sort of argumentative or objection to what you're, to the principle you're putting forward there, but what do you think, I mean, would, is there anything, any encouragement you could offer to somebody like that who says, you know, I just, I really don't understand, but I don't want to look stupid, even though this leader is doing a great job of communicating, I'm still reticent, uh, to, mm -hmm. to raise my hand. Yeah, there are those environmental dynamics that in, in a business or in the military or in, in any kind of hierarchy, sometimes it can be not as easy to admit ignorance or to ask for clarification. But I think one of the easiest ways to do it is to use the word clarification. So when you either publicly in a group or privately afterwards, to talk to that person and say, you know, just just to be completely clarified on what you're after is what you're saying, this, this, and that. Yeah. And if you've got that question, some others do too. And yeah. you're doing them a big favor and the leader a big favor by giving a chance to clarify. Yeah. Because if the person says, do you all understand? And 60 people go, oh, yes, sir, we understand. Yes, sir, we understand. <laughs> You know what? In the military, lives could be at stake if they don't understand. Yeah. So asking for clarification is a good way to do it. Repeating back what you think you heard. Yeah. So you weren't, you know, tuning out. You're doing everybody a favor that way. What I found um, carrying that unconscious habit forward with me leaving the military was that people would say something to me or explain something to me where I had a, a, you know, a very rudimentary, very basic understanding of the topic. And so if they explained something out to me, I would say, oh yeah, I got it. And the reality was I didn't have it. Right. <laughs> and it's an entrepreneurship has forced me out of that. Entrepreneurship has forced me to say things like, when you said this, this is what I think I hear. Yeah. This is what I'm, I, I think I know what you mean. But actually, I don't. <laughs> right. Actually, I have no idea what you mean. Or I, I only have a vague idea of what you mean. Or you meant something completely different, and I'm taking it out of context. I'm applying that into a context that I'm not currently in. And what I... So to, just to reinforce what you're saying there, I think it's 
one thing I've done in certain leadership contexts with the people on my team is said, here's what I said, and here's what I hoped you heard, but that may still not be what you actually heard. Right. And so if it's not what you actually heard and you, or you still don't know what I'm talking about, I want you to know, I don't think you're stupid. (laughs) Right. And if you want to talk to me privately or here in front of the group, I don't care, but just make sure that you heard what I said. Well, part of this is what leads up to, to rule number four, getting on the same page. Getting on the same page is an opportunity to simplify and summarize in writing exactly what you meant. Mm-hmm. And so that's the, after a meeting or, or after some kind of you know, instruction, having some way, some shorthand summary to ensure that people can look at it and say, oh, I didn't. That's not what I heard. Holy cow! I better I better get clear on that. Is really important, and it's part of the mentality that is. We've we've sort of brought it up the word multiple times here. Never assume. Yeah. Don't assume. Don't assume. And we've got to get that into our heads. Assume that there's so much noise, competition, and distraction that people won't hear. Assume that they have a whole different set of knowledge in their head. And they won't see it the same. Yeah. Assume that people hear selectively and forget frequently, unless yeah. I summarize. Just that's reality. Yeah. Absolutely. It's not. Um, it's not what we'd all prefer it to be, but it, but in many ways, it's the counterpart to how we should assume about ourselves that you know I, just because I heard somebody say this on a TED talk or something doesn't mean I understand it. Just because I've read about a place in a book doesn't mean I've been there. The best, tra- the best training for all this stuff, when you strip away all the professional stuff, is bringing up children. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to have a point, get right to the point, explain, illustrate, define. I mean, it, that's what you're doing when you bring up kids. And uh, Or my wife, who is a teacher, or in earlier days, I did teaching preaching and I was wrestling with all these concepts. When you open a sermon, how are you going to secure attention? How are you going to reinforce certain points? What are you going to summarize at the end? What stories? Yeah. So these are, the, in fact, the vast majority of these principles, I've just pulled them right out of the Bible. Yeah, Jesus was a master storyteller. He was a great use of, of word pictures and analogies and parables and all of that stuff. The Ten Commandments is a summary. Getting on the same page, stone page in this case, summary. And mm-hmm. then when Jesus said, take that, and you, let's summarize that down, distill that down to two things. Yeah. Love God and love your neighbor. Masterful simplification and summary. And so you can find every principle in this book scattered throughout writings for generations because Human communication is human communication. It's just what it's always been. We have the same operating system, even in an environment like now where we're flooded with information, the brain still works the same way. And so these are timeless principles that just work. I'm curious, as we're winding down our time for this podcast, uh, why was it important for you to write this book? The idealistic reason was because clear communication just is absolutely vital. And in all my roles of sales and marketing and consulting and teaching and all that, I've, re- I've wrestled with this stuff for over 40 years. So it has been part of me all along, always been trying to learn how to communicate, even when I didn't have the words clarity or didn't know what this formula was going to be. I was wrestling with it all along. Yeah. The more mercenary approach is, uh, from a business perspective, I saw a tremendous unmet need to you know, put my foot into an area where there is a lot of impact that can happen. And so by developing, writing the books, and developing the workshops, and doing all that I've worked around this, this piece of intellectual property, it's a phenomenal high-impact business that I'm developing uh, and just so happens that I absolutely 
love the stuff. I mean, I'm very passionate about it, and people notice that when I give my workshops. I, I'm an introvert, and I get real passionate when I'm talking about this stuff because I believe it's not just something I picked up along the way. Um, and I see, I see what happens when people get the light on, when yeah. people are able to articulate their own strengths, their own abilities, their own brand in a way that works. And I, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled by it. Yeah. I love that process that you talked through of wrestling with a given topic for many years. Some of us wrestle with things for decades. And then becoming a master of that by uh, educating perhaps ourselves on, on whatever that topic is, distilling all of our thoughts, gathering from, like you talk about, a universe of information that, you know, maybe these aren't, maybe these are uh, the same points repackaged that have been talked about and, and certainly delivered on it for three thousands of years. But taking all of that stuff that you're struggling with and then going, wait a second here, I, maybe I'm primed to see the opportunity in the marketplace that other people are struggling with this as well. What if I, what if I become a master of this and then pass that on to these folks and watch it transform their, their, their work or their relationships? Well, the thing, the way I'm wired is I'm highly analytical. I systematize things and I simplify things. And so this book is 40 years worth of doing that over and over again until it, until it took a shape that I could actually write down. Mm. Most authors don't have the luxury of 40 years between books, uh, but that's just the way this worked. I mean, I, they, I, I couldn't not write the book. No. And, uh, and I would say for all the budding authors out there, if you've got a high impact, especially business book, and you know you've got something that can change lives, get a great editor. Because not everybody that has great ideas is great with words and sentence structure. And I worked with a very top-notch editor on both of my books, and he was ruthless, and I wanted him to be ruthless. I wanted everything in this book to be clear, and boy, he beat the thing up real good. And it was, it was painful, but it was good. And that's what good writing is. You've got some the real labor pains to go through to finally have something that somebody can pick up and go, holy cow, I get it. And I'm going to change right now. And that's worth it. Absolutely. Yeah, as, as I often tell our authors, um, working with a great editor is actually a lot like working with a great accountant. You're going to get reconciled one way or the other. <laughs> And you don't have as much money as you think you do. <laughs> yep, that's correct. You're not as smart as you thought you were. <laughs> that's right. Well, Steve, this has been great. It's been great talking through this. Um, Jason and I swim and breathe and eat this stuff all day, and we could talk about it for hours, but we're out of time for this edition of the Emissary Authors Podcast. Uh, where can we send people who want to know more about you? So my website is stevewoodruff.com, and that uh, has uh, all the contact information and some videos and, and description of the workshops I do. And then a lot of my social media has pretty much settled into LinkedIn. So I've been a very early adopter with social media over the years, but my strongest foothold is in LinkedIn. So I have a newsletter people can follow and, and get every week, and, uh, and I do a lot of sharing of resources and information and network through LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, it's been great having you on the show, Steve Woodruff. Thanks again for sharing your wisdom with us, taking a little bit of time to help people understand how important it is to have and get to the point. And with that, we're going to see you next time on the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders, executives, and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter my name is Paul Edwards. My co-host is Jason Todd. We've been chatting with Steve Woodruff, author of The Point, and we'll see you next time.